So we're looking at buffer solu solutions. Buffer solutions are, you know, the solutions in which the, <coughs> we have an acid and base that coexist. You know, they don't uh, neutralize each other out. And so this uh, has special properties. One of the properties it has is a, is a stable pH. So one of the calculations we try to do is to, to figure out the pH of buffer. We can't do all buffer solutions easily. Some buffers, you know, like acetic acid and ammonia, need to be solved simultaneously. There you have three equations that need to be solved simultaneously, so that's quite a bit more complex than the two equation one we were looking at earlier. Two equation one we just gave up on. Didn't bother solving the whole thing. But anyway, let's come back to this. So we've got an acid base that coexists. Now there is one type of buffer <coughs> that's very easy to solve, and that is when the acid and, and base are related. And again, these are weak acid, weak base. That's how we can get them to coexist. <coughs> now, if, if these are related, uh, i.e., uh, they're conjugates, then um, then the math is very easy. And so, one example is the buffer we did the other day, which is acetic acid and sodium acetate. And so, I'm going to abbreviate acetate as AC rather than write up the whole formula formula. And so for acetic acid and sodium acetate, we need sig significant quantities of both. I mean, we can't just have uh, trace amounts of sodium acetate. For example, if, if we had pure acetic acid, pure acetic acid would hydrolyze water to form acetate. It's not that quantity. We need much more. And so we have to have significant quantities of both. For example, 0.1 molar. 0.1 molar would be considered a significant quantity. <coughs> So here, significant quantities of both must be present in order to be considered a buffer. And so in chapter 17, the, the typical approach to the problem is we'll take the strongest acid and react it with the strongest base. And so the strongest acid present here would be acetic acid, and the strongest base present would be either water or acetate. Um, what do you think is stronger, water or acetate? It would be acetate. And so sodium acetate would be the strongest base present. And uh, acetic acid plus sodium acetate yields sodium acetate plus acetic acid. So this would be like a double replacement type reaction, acid base reaction. Nothing, nothing really changed. In fact, nothing changed. So what we say is there's no reaction here. Well, we took this acid and reacted with the strongest base present, and if nothing happens there, um, we end up in the same stuff. Then we, we, then we try to react it with the next strongest base. Okay, so sodium acetate would be the strongest base. What's the next strongest base present? The next strongest base for this presence is water. And so we'd have water, H2O liquid. This is going to produce hydronium and acetate. All right, and then uh, once we do that, uh, well, I, once we do that, then are we done? No, we also have to worry about the base, too. And we'd worry about KW as well. What about the base? The base is sodium acetate. Sodium acetate is a strong electrolyte so that breaks up into sodium ions and acetate ions. Actually, the base is acetate ions. The sodium acetate we call soluble salt. And so the acetate will hydrolyze water to form acetic acid and hydroxide. And this would be KB. And so it looks like we'd have to do the KA for acetic acid followed by the KB for sodium acetate or acetate as a start and then KW, right? But when you look at the KA and KB, what do you notice about those? When you look at the KA and the KB, 
something really stands out. I see it right off. Do you? If I look at those two, the KA and the KB, they look very similar. The first one describes the equilibrium between acetic acid and acetate. The second one describes the equilibrium between what and what? Acetate and acetic acid. And so it's the same equilibrium. In fact, the only difference is one's in terms of hydronium, the other's in terms of hydroxide. But in other words, um, we do either. We would not do both of these because that would be a waste of time. If we did both of these, then we're going to get should get the same answer if we do it correctly. And so we pick it's an either either A or B, but not both A and B. So uh, let's take a look at at this. Since we're interested in pH, what would be more? more direct. Um, if you're interested in pH, <coughs> would it be easier to do the Ka or would it be easier to do the Kb? It would be easier to do the Ka. The Ka is in terms of hydronium, so that would give us the pH. This is in terms of hydroxide, so this would give us the pOH, which in turn would require an additional step to convert that into pH. And so it's better to do this because uh, we'll go to straight to pH, but it's not required. I mean, we could do Kb as well. All right, so in a, in a case like this, as long as we have significant initial concentration, so what, what I mean by significant in, initial concentrations would be, you know, a significant amount of acetic acid present. Now, there's going to be acetate here normally because even if we had no acetate to begin with, acetic acid hydrolyzes water to form hydronium and acetate. So we'll get acetate there, but the amount of acetate that we get from the hydrolysis is not that big. And so when we're talking about significant amounts, that means we have to start off with acetate there to begin with. And so we need both an initial amount of acetic acid and an initial amount of acetate. And that's what you guys did. You took that sodium acetate to do that. All right. And then uh, continuing on here, we're going to hydrolyze some of the acetic acid with water. That's going to produce some hydronium and produce some acetate. And so at the end of step one here, I'm going to call this step one. At the end of step one, I'm going to have my initial acetic acid minus some from hydrolysis, and then X, and then the initial acetate, plus X here. Um, X here, this is equal to the hydronium ion concentration at the end of step one. That's the hydronium ion concentration at the end of step one, but you know, we have to add to this the hydronium from step two. The hydronium from step two um, is going to be from water, Kw. Do you expect much additional hydronium from water hydrolysis, water autoionization? No, uh, I don't expect too much more. One, Kw is 10 to the minus 14. You know, here, Ka is 1.8 times 10 to the minus 5. And so Kw is so small, 10 to the minus 14, that we would expect most of the hydronium to be generated in step one. And so what I'm going to do is let's go ahead and set this up to solve for x here. And so Ka is equal to the hydronium ion concentration at the end of step one, the equilibrium actually, acetate divided by the HAC. So we'll leave this as the hydronium ion concentration at the end of step one. 
and then the, the acetate at the end here is going to equal the acetate initial plus x. So this will be times the acetate initial plus x. And then the acetic acid at the end here is going to be the acetic acid initial minus x. It's going to be acetic acid initial minus x. And so when we look at this, um, we're going to solve for x. Well, here in this case, um, well, the hydronium is x as well. In this case, probably the easiest thing to do is try the simplifying assumption. We use the simplifying assumption saying that x is much smaller than the initial, which it should be in a buffer. In a buffer, we need significant quantities of both. So it means it's likely simplifying assumption should work. It's a weak acid, so you don't expect them to hydrolyze much. And so that's going to give us this. It's going to give us the hydronium ion concentration at the end of step one times the acetate concentration, initial, divided by the HAC concentration, initial. Next, what we're going to do is we're going to take the negative log of both sides. So we'll take the negative log of the left side and the right side. <coughs> the negative log of the Ka is called the pKa. So the pKa, actually, let me write it out. It would be the negative log of the Ka is equal to the negative log of the hydronium. acetate. But this acetate is not going to be the end of step one. This acetate is actually at the initial beginning, assuming that there's very little change in this acetic acid is the initial too. So we'll use the property of logs here. The negative log of Ka is just called the pKa. The negative log of the hydronium is the pH um, plus a minus log of uh, the acetate to HAC ratio. And then rearrange this, we get the pH is equal to the pKa plus the log of the acetate to HAC. Initial. Uh, this equation is called the Henderson Hasselbalch equation. And it's for buffers that are related to each other. That is, they're for buffers that the components are conjugates to one another. When we look at this equation, we say, see that these are the initials. If these are the initials, then um, this means that we do not have to use the ice table to figure out the pH of the Henderson Hasselbalch buffer. And so I, I would skip. In fact, we don't need to solve for those unless we are looking for the inventory. If we're looking for the inventory, then we have to solve that. And so if I had this buffer, 0.1 molar, 0.1 molar, then I could just go to straight to pH. The pH will equal the pKa of acetic acid plus the log of the acetate. HAC. All right, the Ka is 1.8 times 10 to the minus 5, which gives us a pKa of 4.744 plus the log of the acetate. Well, the acetate is going to be 0.1 molar, and the HAC is going to be 0.1 molar. And so we end up with the log of 1. Log of base 10 of 1 is just equal to 0, so this comes out to 4744. That would be the pH of this. All right, that's if we have um, what we call a 1 to 1 ratio, you know, base to acid or acid to base, 1 to 1 ratio. But we tried to get not a pH of 474. The pH we were shooting for was a pH of 5. And so we could get, actually, it's pretty easy to get a pH of 5. If we wanted to get a pH of 5 from this, all we need to do is, is to increase the amount of base. 
the more base there is, the higher the pH. And so that's what we did in the lab. Well, what we could do um, now is um, look at the Henderson Hasselbach based on KB rather than KA. Um, like I said, you could either use the KA or the KB. If we decided to use the KB, then the initial would be the acetate initial. Water is a pure liquid. It's the HAC initial, the hydroxide initial. So there's going to be a change here. Oops. No, we don't have any. Sorry, we don't have any hydroxide. The hydroxide initial is zero molar. We assume no collisions are taking place. So we have our initials. And then we allow the collisions to take place. So this is going to be minus x, plus x, plus x. And so at equilibrium, we'll have um, acetate minus x, x, oh, excuse me, acetic acid, initial, plus x, and then x. Here, x is equal to the hydroxide concentration at the end of equilibrium. And so uh, Kb is going to equal the HAC at the end times the hydroxide at the end divided by the acetate at the end. And so just plugging it in, the HAC at the end is going to equal the HAC initial minus x, or actually not minus, plus x. And then the hydroxide at the end of this is just going to equal x, or I'm just going to type in hydroxide at the end here, divided by uh, the acetate initial minus x. So what we'll do is uh, we'll do the simplifying assumption again here. The simplifying assumption just says x is small compared to the initial, so that's just going to give us an acetic acid initial over the acetate initial and the hydroxide at the end. Then we'll do the same thing. We're going to take the negative log of both sides. And so the negative log of Kb is called the pKb, or the power function of Kb. This is going to equal the negative log of this ratio, so it's going to be the negative log of the HAC over the AC minus plus the negative log of the hydroxide. This is going to be the hydroxide at the end. The HAC and the acetate will be the initial. So the negative log of the hydroxide is called the pOH. And so we do a little bit of rearrangement. The pOH is going to equal the pKb plus the log of the HAC over AC minus. So if I plug it in here, it would be the pKb for the base. If I plug it in here, I'm going to get a pOH. From that pOH, I can get the pH. And that pH is going to come out the same as this. You know, one the... Um, Acid to base ratio is one. All right, so uh, we don't do nearly that many pOH calculations. We do mostly pH calculations. Now, I had to assume a couple of things. Do you know what I had to assume? One, I had to assume the simplifying assumption succeeds. This assumption is not so bad because I have common ion here, and uh, which I erased earlier, but I have common ion present. Common ion is going to decrease the amount of 
reaction that occurs. And so if both of these were zero, um, I'd have an increase in the amount of reaction that occurs. But since I have one of these, then it doesn't take much to get to the correct ratio. Uh, that was uh, one assumption. What was the other assumption? The other assumption was that step two is negligible. What is step two? For over here, step two would be, and in the previous one, step two would be what? Over there, we're looking at hydroxide ion producers. In the previous derivation, we're looking for hydronium ion producers. And so acetic acid is one, acetase isn't. And so there's one more hydronium ion producer, it would be water. And the same thing here, water. But um, likely, I can ignore that because, you know, if I start off with 0.1 molar, 0.1 molar, Know, generate a decent amount of hydroxide or hydronium. Which means um, KW isn't going to be as significant. In fact, um, what's the most hydronium or hydroxide I can get from KW? The most. The most I can get is in pure water, which is uh, it's ten to the minus seven molar. That's the most I'm going to get. You know, um, typically I get a lot less, like ten to the minus eight, ten to the minus nine molar. And so, a point one molar acetate or point one molar acetic acid, actually both, we expect a more significant quantity of that. And so, in this, uh, if I go through the calculation, I'll get a POH. So if either one would, would work, but not both together. Um, sometimes what people do when they do both together is they add up the pHs or the pOHs. All right. Um, and so the, the question was, uh, why can I skip step two? Um, the answer was that. Uh, you know, if it contributes only 10 to the minus 7, 10 to the minus 8, 10 to the minus 9 molar, it won't be significant. And so the Henderson Hasselbach saves you a considerable amount of time because you don't have to do the ice table. And so uh, when we have a 1 to 1 ratio, then the pH that we calculated is 4.74. This one we can think of as the optimum pH. The optimum pH would have equal amounts of base to acid equal quantities or concentrations or amounts, equal concentrations of base and acid. And that's 474. Uh, we have something called the buffer system. Uh, actually, which is what we're looking at and buffer range. For this particular buffer system, our buffer range is this. We can go all the way up to 
and all the way down to three point seven four. And so what we did in lab was we tried to get a pH of five. Five point zero zero is within the buffer range here between three seventy four and five seventy four. Now why do we have this range um, here between 374 and 574, it has to do with the ratio. If I take a look at the ratio of um, base, which is the acid, I mean acetate over acid, HAC, then at the optimum pH we have a one-to-one -one ratio. We have equal amounts of acid and base. It just so happens the acid is a better acid than the base is a base. Otherwise, if we have equal amounts of acid and base, you'd think we, we would have um, a neutral solution, a pH 7 solution, but it turns out it's not pH 7. The reason it's not pH 7 is because the acid is way better than the base in this case. And so we're looking at this ratio. If we drop it down to 374, we need more acid. And in fact, at 374, it's a 1 to 10 ratio. Um, that ratio comes from the henderson hasselbalch equation. The pH is equal to 474 or plus the log of the base to acid. So we're looking at this ratio here. Um, if we had a 1 to 10 ratio, then log base 10 of 110 or 0 0.1 is 1. Minus one, and so this this would drop it down here, and likewise up here would be a ten to one ratio, and so we just add more. Well, can't we just continue to add more here? Let's say if I wanted to go to six seventy four or seven seventy four, is that okay? Or or eight seventy four? Yeah, it, it, we just have to change the ratio. In order to get to 674, we need to go to 100 to 1. To get to 774, we need to go to 1,000 to 1. 874, we need 10,000 parts of base to every one part of acid. And the same thing happens when we go down. If we were to go down to 274, we're going to need 1 to 100. So 100 times more acid than base. That's what that's saying. If we go down to 174, we need 1,000 parts of acid for every one part of base. The problem is, is, is this. This is getting too lopsided. A good buffer should have both acid and base present in significant quantities. Um, if we start going to this, let's say, if I made my, um, this is more base, if I made my acid 0.1 molar, if I made my acid 0.1 molar, then in order to get this ratio, I would need to make my base 1,000. And so if I wanted to bring the pH up to around 8 or 9 or 7, whatever, you know, I would need about 1,000 molar. Well, 1,000 molar would be well, a thousand molar, it, we, we use, what did we use for acetate last time? We used sodium acetate trihydrate. Sodium acetate trihydrate was 138 grams per mole. So I need a thousand moles of that, so I need 138,000 grams of sodium acetate to dissolve in one liter. Is that going to happen? In other words, let's say I wanted to use this buffer system to make a buffer uh, pH 874. And let's keep one of these at 0.1. It doesn't, it doesn't really matter. Uh, but one way of thinking about this is if my HAC concentration to AC minus concentration initial, initial is 10,000 parts. So I'll make this one 10,000 molar, and then I'll make my acetic acid one molar. Well, getting one molar acetic acid is no problem. How about getting 10,000 molar acetate? Is that a problem? Um, yeah, that's going to be a problem. 
you, we need to dissolve 1.3 million grams of sodium acetate in a liter. Is that going to happen? No. Of the trihydrate. And so this is very difficult. But, you know, we don't have to make it like this. How about this? If we made the... Um, If we made the, let's make the acetate one molar. Can we make one molar acetate solution? Yeah, that should be no problem. If we make the acetate one molar, then the acid concentration should be one ten thousand. One ten thousandth molar. Is that right? Times 10 to the minus 4. One ten thousand, yeah. About 100,000. So. Now, if I made this uh, the acetate 1 molar, then that means the acetic acid has to be 0 0.001 molar. Now, would you consider that a significant quantity of acid? And so this is too lopsided. It's a problem. And the same thing here, these would be too lopsided. And so in this range, we want to keep it between 10 to 1 and 1 to 10 there. Well, a pH of 5 is no problem. If we want a pH of 5, what does the ratio have to be? Well, it has to be a little bit more base. That is, the numerator has to be a little bit bigger. And so to figure out the, for pH of 5, what we need, we're going to go with a pH of 5.00. We need the pKa, which is 4.744, um, plus the log of the acetate to HAC ratio. And then we do the math. We do the math, um, we'll come out that the acetate to HAC ratio should equal, you know, 1.803, something. And so this is not extreme. I mean, we have about twice as much base as acid, but it's not like 10 times as much. And so this is OK. And therefore, if we make the acetate 1.8 molar, then the HAC has to be 1 molar. Well, that's easy. We could do that. If we make the um, acetate 1 molar, then the HAC would be, you know, invert 1.8, so it would be like 0.6. 0.4 molars. And so all you guys did was you added additional acetate to this to bring the pH up. Well, we can keep adding acetate and keep bringing the pH up, but there's going to be a limit. And that limit here, well, as far as practical buffers go, the limit is in this range here. You know, we don't want it too lopsided. The reason we don't want it too lopsided is because uh, one of the things that the buffer has to do The buffer has to um, <clears throat> resist pH changes by reacting with the acids and bases that we add to it. And so, uh, for example, um, the next uh, thing we talk about, in addition to buffer range, is buffer capacity. One of the things that buffer should do is resist pH changes even upon dilution. So if I have 0.1 molar, you know, HAC um, and 0.1 molar AC minus, you know, this should give us a pH of 474. What if I had um, 0.001 molar HAC and 0.001 molar? AC minus, then uh, the same thing, the pH is going to come out to 4, 7, 4. So both of these are going to give us the same pH. The difference is the capacity. You know, this one's dilute here. This one's much more concentrated, so it would have a higher capacity. In fact, the more concentrated, the better. So if we want one molar HAC, one molar acetate, then that would be even better. The pH 
should be more stable. And so this one has the highest capacity, this one would have the lowest capacity, this one would be somewhere between the two. Now, um, adding water and diluting it doesn't change the ratio because it's going to dilute both the acetate and the HAC together. And therefore, the pH shouldn't change when we add water. But it depends on the capacity, though, too, because if it's already very dilute, then adding more water is going to make it even more dilute. And the more dilute the buffer is, the more pure water-like it is. You know, if you don't have that much stuff in there, it's going to resemble water. And so as you continue to dilute these buffers, the pH starts to approach 7. In this case. All right, so when we think about buffers, um, let's do some standard buffer calculations. And so, do buffers work, and how do they work, and what are they supposed to do? Well, they're supposed to resist pH changes. So, let's go ahead and we're going to take 10.00 milliliters of water. Let's say this is pure water. What's the pH of pure water? What is it supposed to be? Seven. And so let's just start off with some pure water, pH seven. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna add, I'm gonna add uh, one drop of six molar HCl. We have more sick things here, 6.00 molar HCl. Do you know approximately uh, how many milliliters one drop is? How many, mil uh, how many drops are there in a milliliter? 20. And so that means a drop is about 0.05 milliliters. We'll just say 0.05 milliliters, approximately. But it depends on the surface tension. And so this is something new in chapter 17. In chapter 17, we do something called step I, like, this, like an intro step. Step I, and this is what I do, um, Petrucci calls it something else. But what step I is, it's solution dilution. Solution dilution, um, we're interested in the molarity of the dilute sample. The molarity of the dilute sample is going to be the volume of the concentrated over the volume of dilute times the molarity of the concentrated. This fraction here, the volume of the concentrated over the volume of dilute, this is called the <coughs> dilution factor. And so the dilution factor would go something like this. Let's say the original volume was 1, then we doubled the volume. So we took one part and made it two parts. And so it's going to be more dilute if we take one part and make it two parts. In fact, it's going to be half as concentrated. It's a one to two dilution. We could do a one to three dilution, take one part of the concentrated, dilute it into a total of three parts. So one third, etc. And so we have the dilution factor here. And so what we have to do is after we mix it, when we mix two solutions, we always have we always have to do solution dilution because do you think the mixture is going to have six molar? Now the mixture is going to have way less than six molar, and so now I have a total volume. It's going to be ten point zero zero plus one drop, and so I'll call it ten point oh five milliliters. So ten milliliters plus a drop, and then over here I need to calculate the new HCl concentration. The new HCl concentration starting here is going to equal, and we call this the initial, but it's not really the initial, the initial is 6 molar. Um, this is the initial when we start mixing it or letting things react. And so anyway, the HCl concentration here is going to be, well, what's the dilution factor? It's a 0.05 being diluted to 10.05. And so it's like, a, a, you know, roughly 1 to 1,000, something like that. Actually less because there's a 5 here. And so um, let's figure it out times the concentration, which was 6 molar. Let's go with 6 molar HCl. And so it's a 5 to 1,000 dilution. Let's do 
that. Five to a thousand five dilution times six one oh two ninety five. I'm only allowed one sig fig here because of the drop. But you know, I want to be careful with round off error, so I'm gonna carry extra digits just to avoid round off error. And so I'll go point oh two nine eight five. Molar. Now, um, HCl we know is a strong acid. Strong acids are strong electrolytes. And so, step one here is the hydrolysis of HCl. HCl will hydrolyze water to form hydronium and chloride. Ka for that is very large. Therefore, all this will be converted into hydronium. And so, in step one, I, I'm going to get, you know, I'm going to skip it but I'm going to get 0.02985 molar hydronium. Step one you can do in your head, and that's HCl. But I have to worry, what else will produce hydronium in the solution? Well, this is HCl in water, so what else will produce hydronium? And so step two would be KW. What's the most hydronium KW can produce? The most. Now, what would the highest concentration of hydronium be that KW can produce? Yeah, exactly. it'd be 10 to minus 7. Uh, but it's not going to be that because of the common ion effect, Le Chatelier's kind of principle. It's going to be less. And so if we're adding 10 to the minus 8, 10 to the minus 9, 10 to the minus 10 molar additional hydronium, is that going to have any impact on the pH? No. And so step 2 should be negligible. We'll ignore it. Um, but that's not the case. When, when was step two significant for hydrochloric acid? Do you recall seeing us do step two and it was very significant for hydrochloric acid? <coughs> In other words, the last time I did the HCl hydrolysis, I had to do step two. Otherwise, I got some kind of ridiculous pH. Do you even do you remember that? No. Nobody can recall doing HCl before, HCl hydrolysis. Juina, did you find it? Well, we did it before. Um, you compare the two, and then you'll see um, why it was very important to do step two in that case versus uh, it's not so important in this case to do step two. And so if we add one drop of uh, 6 molar HCl, the pH changed from 7 to what? Okay, so basically I'm going to base the pH on this hydronium concentration here. It's going to be the 0.0285. Um, The pH comes out to 1.525. 1.525. And so the pH dropped from 7 to 1.5. Now you have to remember this is powers of 10. And so that's like um, 
five to six powers of ten. And so what happened is it be, the water um, in this beaker became a hundred thousand to a million times more acidic uh, with one drop of six more HCl. Yeah. Yeah. So let's see what happens now uh, if I add one drop to a buffer. So um, one thing was this. Was your water pH 7? No, what was your water? pH 5. And so I had you adjust your buffer um, so that uh, it gave us a pH of 5. But now I want to compare it to water, and this is, would be pure water that is freshly distilled water, pH 7. And so what we're going to do is we're going to compare this to buffer. And so this is what we call unbuffered. So I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to add a drop of water. Well, what buffer system am I going to use? Well, I've only used one buffer system so far, and that's acetic acid and acetate buffer. Now, um, I, I just have to figure out the ratio, you know, because what I want is I want a pH 7.00 buffer to match my water, which is pH 7.00. And so in order to get this, all I have to do is change the ratio. In fact, uh, I need to increase the amount of acetate because the acetate is the base uh, versus acetic acid. That will bring up the pH. And so if I have acetic acid acetate buffer system and I want a pH of 7, then what's my ratio got to be? And so I go with a pH of 7. pH of 7 is going to equal the pKa plus the log of the ratio acetate to HAC. Here and then I want to solve for the ratio. pKa I already know is four seven four four. Oops. I screwed up the earlier calculation. So I'm going to subtract four seven four from both sides. Um, so this is going to give me two point two five six, um, which is going to equal the log of the acetate to HAC, acetic acid, acetate to acetic acid. And then we'll take the anti-log both sides, 2.256 is equal to the acetate over HAC. Two point two five six log base ten. So um, if I get this ratio, that means I just need to make the acetate 180.3 molar and the acetic acid 1 molar. Do you think making 180 molar acetate is going to be easy? Oh no, it's going to be really hard. So let me invert this. If I invert this, or I could make the acetate one molar. 
And then I'll have to make my acetic acid 0 0.0055 molar. But when I look at this, you know, this is a thousand times roughly more dilute. And therefore, this is lopsided. Remember, we we're talking about a lopsided buffer? This would be a lopsided buffer. Okay. We need, we'd like, you know, both of them to be in the um, comparable range. This is not good. And so, this system is not good for pH sub and buffer. It's okay for five, it's okay for four. But it's not okay for seven. So I have to look for a new buffer system. And when I look for a new buffer system, what do I look for? I look for a weak acid and it's conjugate base. So I'll just start looking for a weak acid. When I look for a weak acid, um, which one should I use? You could look at this acid base chart in our room. Which ones would make a good candidate? Which acids should I use? <clears throat> well, if I'm looking at the optimum pH, the optimum pH is where we have equal amounts of acid and base. And uh, when that's the case, then the pH is equal to pKa. pKa is the power of the Ka. It's actually the negative power of the Ka. And so looking at that, which of those should we use based on the Ka? Which should work? We don't want to deviate too far. If we deviate far, then the ratio is going to be lopsided. And so looking at these, uh, which one look like good candidates? Look at this one, acetic acid. This is the one we're looking at. Acetic acid has a pKa of 4.74, a Ka of 
1.8 times 10 minus 5. And so it has a power uh, function around 5. So if we use acrylic acid, which is the next one, it's not that much different. You know, the pH would be around, or the pKa would be around 5. This one's perfect. You know, if I had a Ka of 1.0 times 10 to the minus 7, do you know what the pKa is, the power? 7.00. This is perfect. Um, it's perfect because if we mix this, if we mix the acid hydrogen arsenate with its conjugate base, what's the conjugate base of hydrogen isoprene arsenate? This is dihydrogen arsenate. The conjugate base would be monohydrogen arsenate. So if we mix dihydrogen and monohydrogen arsenates in a one-to-one -one ratio, we'll get a pH of 7.00. That's perfect. That's perfect, except for one thing. Arsenate is... Arsenate's highly toxic. And so uh, even though that has a perfect pKa, we aren't going to use it. And so what are we looking for? We're looking for, if we're looking for a pKa, we want to make a pH 7 buffer. And so we should look for a pKa around 6 to 8. That would get us in the range. A pKa, our power greater than 8 or less than 7 is outside the range. That would make too lopsided of a buffer. And so it uh, looks like uh, carbonic is pretty good. You know, carbonic is pKa very close to 7, slightly less. The carbonic looks good, except the problem is, is if you went to the store to buy a bottle of carbonic acid, are you, no, carbonic acid, you're going to get a tank of CO2, or carbonated water. And so uh, that's not good. This is okay. Monohydrogen citrate. Monohydrogen citrate with citrate ion would work, and that has a pKa <coughs> close to 7. So this would work. Let's see what else we can make. There's a problem with monohydrogen citrate. Do you know what it is? The problem with citric acid is um, it's too easy to oxidize this stuff. And so if you have citric acid or you know, monohydrogen citrate in air, the air will decompose it. That is, it'll just start to uh, oxidize slowly in air, form byproducts. And so um, citric acid, you need some kind of antioxidant in there mixed if you're going to use it. The antioxidant would be something even easier to oxidize than citric acid to act as a sacrificial, we call sacrificial reducer. All right, so citric acid we're not going to use. Wow, another perfect. This is perfect. H2S. This is perfect. If we had a one to one ratio of H2S, to HS minus or HS minus to H2S, we get a pH of 7. That would be perfect. But H2S is hydrogen sulfide. You know that as being a toxic and foul smelling gas. And so even though this one's perfect, we can't use it. It's too much hassle. This is kind of close 2.9 from 7 minus 8. That could work. Hypochlorous acid. This might work, although this is probably pushing at 8.9 times 10 to the minus 8. It's almost 10 times 10 to the minus 7, so really close. But hyponitrous acid, have you ever heard of that? Probably not. It's not that common, probably expensive stuff. 
this might work too. Mon monohydrogen melanate ion. Two times ten minus six. This one looks pretty good. The dihydrogen phosphate. Let's go with that one because um, well, that's common and cheap. So let's use that. I think we'll pick the acid. Um, so what we want to do is we want to make a pH 7 buffer. And we did the calculation. Using uh, acetic acid, sodium acetate is not going to work. This is too lopsided. And so we want to make a pH 7 buffer. We need an acid that has a Ka around uh, 7, or pKa around 7, you know, 10 minus 7. So uh, let's look for an acid. And the acid that I see is H2PO4 minus. H2PO4 minus has a Ka equal to 6.3 times 10 to the minus 8, which is close to 10 times 10 to the minus 8, which would be 10 to the minus 7. And so what is the pKa of that? Let's calculate the pKa. The negative log of that, so 6.3 times 10 to the minus 8. And I get 7.200. And so if I had a one-to-one -one mixture of dihydrogen phosphate with the base, monohydrogen phosphate, it's kind of the base, then it would work. And so here would be my buffer system. Dihydrogen phosphate is my acid. Monohydrogen phosphate is my base. Now both of these are amphoteric. Um, what defines one as the acid is it's the strongest acid present. The strongest acid present would be H2PO4 minus, so we'll call this one the acid. This is amphoteric. This one's going to be the base here. So um, we just got to figure out the ratio. The optimum pH is going to be 7.20. Now, the pH range for this buffer system is going to be what? It's going to be the pH range. From what to what? Well, it's going to be from 6.200. At 6.200, we have a 1 to 10 ratio. One part of base, base to 10 parts of acid. If we try to extend the range, let's go to 5.20. If we go down to 5.20, what's the ratio? 1 to a 100. And so we want to keep it within a 1 to 10 to 10 to 1 range. So at the upper limit, what would be the pH? We wouldn't want to go higher than this. 8.20. This is 7.20. We want to go minus or plus 1. This would give us 10 to 1 here. Now, where do these numbers come from? These numbers come from the henderson hasselbalch equation. That is, the pH is equal to pKa plus the log of the ratio. And so 10 would be, uh, 10 to 1 would be plus 1, and then a 1 to 10 would be minus 1. Okay. And so a pH of 7.20 is well within the range. A pH of 7.20, we just need um, a 1 to 1 ratio. Oops, I didn't mean 7.20, I meant 7.00. If I want a pH of 7.00, I just need a little bit more acid in there. And that should drop down the pH. 
All right, well, how much? And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to get the pH uh, equal to 7.00, which is equal to 7.200, plus the log of the ratio. It's a base. HPO4 2 minus over HPO4, H2PO4 minus. So this is going to be minus 0 0.20, so the HPO4 2 minus to H2PO4 minus has got to equal 10 to the minus 0 0.20. Six three zero nine. Point six three zero nine, which means uh, I need point six three to one ratio, or I could flip it over. It'd be one to about one and a half ratio. Maybe I'll flip it. Over. Yeah, let's flip that over. One point five eight four. This would be one to one point five eight four ratio. And so this is what I do to to make this. Um, lava. We've got to pick one of these concentrations. So we can make one of these concentrations. Let's say point one. And so let's say we make this 0.1 an acid. So I have a, a 0.1 molar acid. If I fix one of these, then I can calculate what the other must be. And the other, it's going to be um, this. That's the acid. So for every 1.586 parts of acid, I need one part of base. So it's not terribly lopsided. So what I'm going to have here is I'm going to put in 0.1 molar acid. And that means my base is going to be 0.063 molar. So if I, if I use these concentrations, I should get a pH of 7.00. Let's just confirm using the henderson hassel box. So the pH is equal to pKa, which is 7.200, plus the log of the base to acid. And so base is 0 0.063. The acid is 0.1. Let's see what that comes out to here. Point oh six three divided by point one takes the log of that plus seven point two zero six point nine nine nine. And so it checks out. So there's my pH 7 buffer, but we ran out of time because I got to talk about labs, so we're not going to finish this calculation until I'm 
uh, next time. Let's talk about the lab. Uh, tomorrow's lab is titration. Uh, titration follows buffers in chapter 17. We're going to do two titrations. We're going to do a standard phenolphthalein titration. In a standard phenolphthalein titration, there's only one um, measurement that you do during the titration. That's how much titrant you added, sodium hydroxide. That's one. Well, the other titration we're going to do is the <coughs> pH titration. In a pH titration, we generate a titration curve. Titration curve has pH plotted on the y-axis and then volume, milliliters of sodium hydroxide on the x-axis. In a standard phenolphthalein titration, we just titrate it to where the phenolphthalein starts to turn pink. We call that the end point. This is wrong. Oh no, maybe this is okay. It looks like and so we only titrate it to here. In a pH titration, what we want to do is we want to monitor the pH from the very beginning of the titration to the end. A lot of people think this is the end of the titration, but it's not. You know, once the pink color, you've achieved that, we're going to continue watching and monitoring the pH, and we're going to overshoot. Like, for example, they, they got the, the end or equivalence point at about 25 milliliters. They went all the way to 50, and so they overshot this by 50, 25, 25 milliliters. That's exactly what we're going to do too. We're going to collect a whole bunch of data. Now collecting data like this is, is nice because it looks like they collected a continuum of data. You know, just the continuous monitoring of the pH as we went through this. However, um, we can't collect a continuum of data. We can't collect a continuum of data because um, we can only add sodium hydroxide drop by drop. We're not going to go a half a drop or a quarter drop. We're going to go a full drop. If we go a full drop, then what that means is that there's going to be no data between the drops. And so when we do our pH titration, we want to monitor it drop by drop. So our first drop will record the pH next drop here, but we're going to have a gap. And the gap is going to have no data, but as long as we take a lot of data, then we can assume or extrapolate or interpolate between points and figure out where we are. Now, if we do 50 milliliters, you know, um, how many drops <coughs> in a milliliter, roughly? How many drops in a milliliter? 20 drops in a milliliter. We have 50 milliliters, that's 1,000 drops. 1,000 drops would mean 1,000 data points. 1,000 data points is really good. There's 1,000 data points that's going to give us pretty high resolution of this. It's not going to be like this. This looks like even better resolution than data points. But, you know, if we do a drop by drop, we get 1,000 data points. 1,000 data points is going to easily um, map out the entire curve. And so we collected the data drop by drop. Now, how long would it take to measure a thousand pH readings? Well, let's see. We have, um, let's, we're going to have approximately two hours to do this, maybe less. So, so we need to do a thousand divided by um, two hours. Let's divide it by um, sixty. Thirteen, thirteen point eight seconds. We need to collect a, a pH reading every thirteen point eight seconds. Possible to finish this lab? 
No, totally impossible. There's no way we're going to be able to do that. And so what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to sacrifice some resolution. We have to sacrifice some resolution because there's not enough time. But um, where do we want to sacrifice it? Well, if we go ahead and say, rather than collecting at one drop intervals, let's collect it at one milliliter intervals. So the resolution isn't as good because something might happen in this one milliliter that we'll miss. And so all we're going to do is we're going to probe this every milliliter. And eventually this is going to shoot up like that. So as we probe this, the problem we run into is we don't know We don't know exactly where this shoots up. As you can see there, there's going to be a dramatic change in the pH. And that dramatic change in the pH is close to where we neutralize it. And so does the dramatic change in pH happen right at the beginning here? Or right at the end? Or somewhere in between? Because this is totally blind here. We didn't collect any data here. And so we need to know where this shoots up in order to, to, to analyze our data, in order to see our curve. Right. And so that means um, this. What we need to do is we need to spread out the data here, and then we need to tighten up the data when we think there's going to be something happening, we got to slow things down and collect it drop by drop so we can figure out where exactly this shot up by collecting additional data. And so it turns out it was neither there nor here, it was somewhere in between. The problem is, is this is an unknown acid, so how do we know when to slow down to drop by drop? Jack, do you have the name? Yeah. What we're going to do is we're going to do a, a two titrations. The first titration is kind of your throwaway titration, but you don't want it to treat it like a throwaway titration. Because if your first titration uh, fails, then second one. The first titration we're going to do is a phenolphthalein titration. Uh, when phenolphthalein turns pink, like here, this is what the color bar is showing us. When phenolphthalein starts to turn pink, then we're right in this region where it shoots up. And so that means we're going to do one rapid titration just to phenolphthalein and then figure out how many milliliters that is. And then we're going to weigh about the same amount of sample, or, you know, it could be a different amount of the sample, but we're going to weigh an amount such that we can figure out where this is going to shoot up. And so let's say in our phenolphthalein titration, it shoots up at about five milliliters. Five milliliters is too quick. And so we should use more sample. Because we want it to shoot up around 25 to 35 milliliters. Or let's say it shoots up at four, 45 milliliters. 45 milliliters is too late. And so we need to use less sample. We use less sample that we bring back. And so what we're going to do is whatever amount of sample we use, um, we're going to adjust it such that our pH titration will shoot up around 25 to 35 milliliters. And so just adjust the sample size. Once we do that, then we know, okay, where phenolphthalein turned pink, right before then is where we want to slow down. It looks like, you know, a few milliliters before then, you better slow down and then collect drop by drop. Not only th this, every semester, some people stop here. You know, we have one throwaway, that is, it's not really a throwaway titration, one titration where we only collect one data point, and then we do the pH titration. And when people go to the pH titration, they stop here because they're accustomed to stopping when we don't fail and turn pink. We, we don't stop there. We continue doing drop by drop until it flattens out. 
When it flattens out, then we'll space it to larger intervals. But we gotta get this whole curve mapped out drop by drop. This. Over here, we don't need it drop by drop because it's just fairly flat. And over here, we don't need it drop by drop either. But this is for monoprotic acid. So there's one additional complication, and that is we could have a diprotic acid. If we have a diprotic acid, then um, the curve looks like this. So if we have a diprotic acid, we're going to have two steep rises in the pH. The first one corresponds to the first equivalence point. The second one is the second equivalence point. Now phenolphthalein is going to catch the second. And so we'll have an idea of where the second equivalence point is based on what phenolphthalein turned pink. And so what we're going to do is we're going to cut this volume in half. And that's where the first equivalence point is. You don't know if you have a monoprotic or diprotic, so everybody's going to do this. What everybody's going to do is at the half equivalence point, what we call the half, halfway point here, we're going to slow down and collect data drop by drop so not to miss anything that might happen here. And then speed it up. And then again, as we approach this point, we're going to slow it down and collect it drop by drop. And we'll continue collecting drop by drop until it flattens out. And then once it flattens out, we send the intervals here. That way we can finish the All right, so the whole point of uh, uh, tomorrow is uh, data collection. There's no handout for this. I, I know I put a handout there. So the handout is data collection, how to collect data with enough resolution and within the time limits that you have. So you'll have to play around with it. Well, what you want to do is you want to collect the most data possible in the amount of time we have. Okay. And so it's a little bit of a challenge, but you, you'll have to figure it out. Um, everybody's is going to be different. Okay, stop here.